All right. Good evening. Welcome to the September 5th planning board meeting for the town of Mills River. I'd like to call the meeting to order and let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, first of all, we'll start with the approval of the agenda. Are there any adjustments or anything anyone would like to add, or subtract? If not, if there would be a motion. Make a motion. And yep. all right, thank you, sir. Do we have a second? All right, thank you, Mr. Cole. All in favor of approving the agenda? Aye. 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 Thank you. Next, the minutes from the last meeting. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes or are there any suggested uh, changes or additions from the minutes? All right, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Make a motion. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. Are there, is there a second? All right, thank you, Mr. Kimsey. Are all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, the minutes are approved. And now for some public comment. Do we have any public comment? All right. If anyone's watching, you know, we would welcome, come visit with us and give us your comment. We'd love to have input. It's always good to see people attend these meetings. Uh, we understand everyone's busy. Uh, busy. If I could speak, maybe that would bring more people in. But we'd love to have, um, love to have more people in attendance. Old business. So discussing a lighting ordinance text amendment and hope everyone's had an opportunity to read this. It was uh, quite a few pages, but it's a very good information in here. So thank you, Mr. Malachek, for putting this together. And if you'd like to talk to us about it, any comments, questions, anything? Can I say one sure. thing for you? Yes, sir, please. Yeah. We got this Thursday, I believe it was. Of course, there's a holiday coming up. And I printed it all out, and I've tried my best <laughs> to scan through it. But uh, uh, we may want to do what we can tonight and come back later. Because I don't think we'll be here all night if we actually <laughs> take this. There's a lot of good stuff in there. I, do, I, I, I totally agree um, with the amount of information. Uh, with the opportunity to look at it, but sometimes when you look at something the first time, then you can get together and discuss it as a group and you go back, you'll see things you didn't see the first time. So I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, do we have, does anyone have any questions or comments about this, especially questions? Are there things that you feel like we need to discuss? And you know, there's a lot of information. Got one question. Sure. Uh, I tried to research it on the internet. Does the county have a lighting ordinance? I couldn't find one as far as county goes. I do not believe Henderson County has one. Hendersonville is is the closest municipality that's adopted one, and that was just this year. If if you want to, uh, Mr. Chairman, I can just go through my staff report and kind of set this up for further yes, sir. discussion if you want. I'm grateful for that. <clears throat> Um, so again, at the last meeting, uh, we discussed the need for a lighting ordinance. And again, including all this information wasn't meant for y'all to read line by line, but what I hope to do tonight is kind of go through it with you and highlight some of the things at least I saw in a couple of the different ordinances that we might you know, be able to borrow from here and there, because I think um, some of them have good sections uh, and some of them have sections that may not be applicable to us. And so um, we can just kick that uh, discussion off and let me share actually this on the screen so the public can see as well. One moment. Okay. So the first one I wanted to review was Hendersonville's lighting ordinance. Again, just because it's the most recently adopted one, 
and uh, I believe they put a lot of time and energy and research into it. And I know there was feedback from the community about it as well. <clears throat> um, so just highlighting what is in this ordinance as an example is that non-residential and multifamily uses are the uses subject to these regulations. Single family and two family homes are exempt. So that would be detached single family and duplexes. And then one thing all the ordinances had in common were exemptions for you know, flagpoles, temporary events, uh, safety lighting, construction lighting, holiday lighting, seasonal lighting, et cetera. And that was something we saw uh, throughout all these ordinances. The Henderson Bell one gets a little technical. Um, they use a, a newer standard that I've heard of called bug measurements, which measures backlight, uplight, and glare from the fixture itself. And then foot candles, which is the general uh, measurement of lighting on the ground at property lines to determine, and you'll hear this term over and over, light trespass. So light leaving a commercial property and let's say disturbing a neighboring residential property. So their main standards, let me scroll down to that section. Computer. Can so I ask there, a question. Yeah, go ahead. So single family and two family units are exempt. How about a development which will be single family homes? Would we require the developer to adhere to this until they're so? Well, construction, like for lighting a construction site, mm -hmm. like if you have to work at night or the DOT that's out there, they're paving, you know, that would be exempt. So my, what I saw through some of the other ones too is, um, and some of the other examples I'll show, they were, do require a lighting plan. Okay. And there's also some ordinances that require light setbacks. Well, so one thing I was gonna propose is for major subdivisions or for any non-residential development in the town, we require a lighting plan they already know where the utilities are usually being wired to. So really it's a matter of just identifying it on the site plan on a separate page and then including fixture details about what exact light fixtures will be installed. And from that, we would be able to determine, does it shine directly out? Is it straight down? Is it only partially down, et cetera? So Sounds good. That, that was one thing I was gonna suggest for major subdivisions include a lighting plan there's also some ordinances that have standards for street lighting mm -hmm. um so that 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 yes, would sir. encompass single family residential but i i do think it's important and again this is just my opinion that we probably not get into the game of looking at someone's floodlights on the side of their house correct yeah i i agree i think just having the ordinance will help people to understand that what you do on your property with lighting can affect someone else so even though we don't regulate it, at least that. Now, that I believe it is Asheville's, and I'll get to that one in a second, that does include single family homes. <clears throat> and there are enforcement provisions. So uh, again, I, I don't think we're appropriately staffed for that. But some of these ordinances, and that's why I wanted to show you the spectrum, do go to the point that if my neighbor has floodlights that are shining in my window at night, I can call code enforcement to come out with a light meter and have that taken care of. Sounds good. Any other questions before I move on? Well, that sort of pretty much can you explain my concern. I had the same concern with the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we exempt them. I mean, in the state of Mill River, we were going to take an acre of land to build it, regardless of where it went on. Next acre on. I certainly don't want to have this bright light shining on me. But why, why are we exempting this single family home? This is what it's all about. We don't have to. That's for this board to decide. I know. But I'm just bringing it up, and I had that underlined that mm -hmm. what you brought up. Uh, because that, to me, is what it's all about. Trying to require them from the get go mm -hmm. to. Put in proper lighting. That's my thought. Mm -hmm. uh, so the 
the other item with the Hendersonville ordinance is again the foot candle measurement. So they actually state <clears throat> that you can have a maximum of one foot candle of light at the property line. And again, let's use the example of a commercial next to a residential property. <clears throat> now you can measure that in the field with a light meter, um, but there are also, I'm forgetting the technical term, lighting diagrams on site plans. I think it's called an ISO Lux drawing that actually shows based on the fixture and the height, how light will be cast and how much light will cover what areas. So that would be another way we could look at that if we require a site plan and an ISO Lux drawing, I think is the term. Um, one thing that I know that came up in the Hendersonville ordinance when I was following this in the news uh, was the conversion of existing non-conforming lights. So again, um, just an example, let's use a storage facility. A lot of the storage facilities have that wall pack lighting that's just a box that just shoots lights straight out. And there are instances where those have impacted residential neighbors. But again, <clears throat> some of these facilities have just been constructed and there have not been those rules in place. So one thing Hendersonville stated is that it's only if, if you replace 50% or more of the lights on the property or 50% or more are repaired that you have to bring the entire site into compliance. Um, I think originally they had a provision that everyone, it's called an amortization clause. Everyone had to bring their lights, again, commercial or non-residential in compliance within like a 10 year period. But I believe there was backlash from the business community about that. Let me fix this audio because I'm getting some feedback. I think, and, and uh, y'all have to can, can confirm this, or I think if you call up Duke Energy, say, I would like to have an area light. I think they're going to bring in LED, and I think it's going to be full cutoff, because that's pretty much what's standard. Yeah, and I, I think that's because they use the, those are their standard fixtures that I think are also similar to the ones used for roadway lighting, but probably not as a, right. So if we if we had a statement about and this Mr. Foster might help all new aerial lighting will conform regardless. So that would cover single family homes, all new. And it shouldn't be an impact on anyone because yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to uh -huh. say everybody's got to change out all these buildings today. But then they need to try to so in the plans. This is a fixture. Somebody might name it over the next time they uh -huh. yeah. But maybe that would be so that's not impacting the homeowner to have to go out and spend money to to do this. It could just be if they get area lighting, that's what they're gonna get. So then Duke Energy would know they've got to meet standards. Then uh, I'm sorry, I think that was probably out of order, but uh, I mean out of the order, not necessarily out of order, but that was Nothing from the chair is out of order. Oh, you're very kind. Can I take this chair home? Um, I will agree. I don't know that my wife and cat will. But. <laughs> so the next one we have as an example is Brevard's lighting ordinance, um, relatively similar to Hendersonville's. Uh, one additional provision they had was a light fixture setback. So you mm -hmm. cannot have a fixture within 10 feet of a property line. Uh, similarly, they have a one foot candle lighting maximum at the property boundary. They go even a little further and measure average light intensity across the whole property and set that standard at four foot candles. Yeah. What? And so. Like full cut off as an example. What, 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 is that obvious or what is that? Actually, let me. You have a one-foot candle diagram you can show hmm. me? I do. Well, actually, I don't I don't have that. So a foot candle, while I'm scrolling real quick uh, to some drawings and the other ordinances, a foot candle is 10.76 lumens. So think of think of how many how much light a bulb puts off, you know. Uh, and again, we're not talking about watts, we're talking about lumens that I believe so. Here's but, my definition of cutoff. If I was standing on this table 
with my eyeballs right at the ceiling level. I couldn't see these uh, these fluorescent lights, but I could see the light from the fluorescent lights of where they're hitting. There may not be fluorescent, there may be LEDs, but that's cut off. It's not shining straight out per se, okay? That. So the drawing uh, on the screen is a decent example. And again, this is from Black Mountain's ordinance. And actually one reason I included this is because um, the administration section, the definitions and the drawings I thought were very well done. That is correct. Uh, text attachment E page one right now. So this is just cut off. So there's full cut off and then there's cut off. Uh -huh. So cut off and I'll just read this uh, fixture where light distribution, no more than two and a half percent of a lamp's light intensity goes above the horizontal plane. So again, the the example on the screen is the best I can do for that. So a suspended light of some kind versus a flush mount versus a one that's recessed like you just said. It could it could be directed any direction technically. Um, it's just it can't protrude or go two and a half percent above the plane of where the the fixture is um, emitting the light in that direction. And again, this is new for me too. Um, and then if we go to full cutoff, here's a good example. No light goes above that 90 degree plane. Page yeah, page two. And if, I mean, the best example is like an area overhead light. Because again, we're we're talking about light pollution, not just on the neighbor's property, but also up into the sky itself. So again, uh, focusing on some of the dark sky friendly um, properties we talked about in the last meeting, full cutoff is, is what achieves that because it only directs the light where it's supposed to go. And there's not a lot of, again, light trespass protruding or, or going out into other areas. So Black Mountain has pages worth of definitions. So that's good for me, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, that was that was one reason I included it because I, you know, this is very technical and we will, you know, an ordinance is only good as what you define and how you can administer it. <clears throat> and so I think this is one section I'd recommend we, you know, borrow from them or, or look at closely. And I'm sorry if I distract for everyone else maybe that way we all no, 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 it's good to get it out there and get it into the record. I wouldn't catch that cut off. I, I thought it was go dim it down or you could cut off all your <laughs> And sure there are some areas in here where that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. where, Dimming. Like uh, for a, a business that has outdoor lighting, they don't need those lights on when they're closed. They do need some security. We all understand the need to to light a parking lot. And it's just we want to make sure that that light. Well, your research, you feel these are fairly important or definition. Yeah, very much so. They're they're standard across the lighting industry. No, that's it was all we're good. But I think it would be good to have definitions in the ordinance and drawings. I think or and to draw icon. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because again, if we do include residential, you know, people people may not know. Clarification: We currently have, we're working with nothing. Correct. Because we have that definition in place, otherwise we're just opening ourselves up. Okay. Going back to to Bart, not that team, but I guess you said this whole thing was. The city of Bart says different shining directly adjacent yard at the center. Sure. You are, sorry, you're for that. Great. Okay. And no, no, please. Thank you. Sure. This is a starting point. I don't think we're sidetracked. I think we're uh -huh. about to help. Okay, good. Well, I, I'm also wondering to the extent these apply to motion sensing lights. Great question. Just gonna. And and I, I just I didn't um, yeah so I, I think that that's a question I have in general about how how these same rules apply 
a slight blanket where you see a motion sensing light or a checking out light that you put on that rock for 10 minutes and then goes back off? Well, I would say if the light is in projection where it should be, it doesn't matter. It just can't. You know, you got it that affect this area or the light up this area. Motion sensing is simply moves in, but it's projected where it should be. Yeah. Well, you want it not next door. You can't temporarily break the door. <laughs> no. While it's on right. the third side. Yeah. There's a there's a drawing in here that shows um, motion sensor and general standards for new outdoor lighting. It's attachment D. Um, and it says all new dust to dawn security lights shall be full cutoff fixtures. The maximum rating not to exceed uh, 9,500 fixture lumens. Basically, is that about 90 watts or 60 watts, something like that? Um, and, and I agree with you, Ms. Marino, about the um, <clears throat> the motion sensor lights. Usually, they're up there to, to, you don't want them on all the time, but if someone or something comes through there, it's a security issue. And I'm wondering if maybe, to an extent, those could be, we, we don't want to set up a situation where people call on their neighbor all the time. My neighbor's motion lights going off all night last night. But then again, you know, can we encourage people to keep the light on their property when this happens? Well, if it's covering the record in the area, it shouldn't be shining on the neighbor. Then they need to correct it with folks in their face. Just because I can see over at their house that it's lighting up over there, as long as it's not projecting over on me or shining through my window, not a problem. Be a question to answer tonight, but I yeah. Well, that's what we're doing. It's something to consider. Even not just for security, but when they come into your driveway at night, um, that's not very specific, but to say that oh, it's protruding off of your driveway, but just depending on the angle, maybe you have to angle it so it only lands on the side of the highway. It's a good good consideration. I think this is something that's, that's becoming more and more important with the growth that we have. Houses get closer together. What triggers a major, major subdivision? Uh, more than 10 lots. Usually, those are the ones where you're going to have, you know, new streets, uh, all new infrastructure. My, again, <clears throat> you may. I mean, I guess a good example too um, of a minor subdivision that does have a new roadway with lighting is um, the Wintercrest subdivision, which is on Banner Farm Road, across from the Roper Farm major subdivision. And Wintercrest, I think, was eight or nine lots, but it was still a new street. And I, I don't remember if they have street lighting, but it's quite possible they do. Um, I I just, you know, with a major subdivision, that's where our ordinance goes the extra mile when we ask for roadway plans. Usually civil engineers are already involved. So requiring a lighting plan, I don't think is a stretch. What does? It it that's um if it's for state maintenance then the dot wants to get involved we require dot standards because that's a pretty well-known standard and we know it's going to work um DOT I, is always going to get involved dot doesn't really get involved yeah. in lighting yeah so 
Yeah, so like Roper being a major subdivision, the road is built to state standards because that's what our ordinance demands, but it can remain private. And if they ever wanted, I mean, getting on the sidetrack, if they ever wanted to dedicate it to the state, the state would basically require an inspection and engineered drawings proving it meets their standards. Yeah. That's the question. It's just tricky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not so much. Or should the town someday, should they, the town be set up to accept roads and maintain roads? Okay. Maybe not. But we want to, I would think that we would want to make that possible if that were to happen at some point. Because what I've seen quite a few instances when I work for the state is the people, the, the developer leaves, people now own the road. And it, especially if it's gravel, but it may not be built to state standards. Well, then it becomes a hardship because once a road starts to fall apart, it's nothing but money. And then they come and ask for help. The state is bound. Um, it, it's very difficult to accept a road onto the state system that's not built to state standards. Very expensive to get it up to state standards. So by requiring that up front, that's so what would be something we would want to trigger. And when we say trigger, this is for town review. This is for you to actually review it along with that site, along with us. Yeah, and I, and I think, well, I guess this is something else for the board to consider. Do we want to actually require lighting or street lighting be installed? Or if it is installed, do we just want to require a plan so we can make sure it meets our standards? Yeah. Well, that's kind of what I'm hearing is that I, I don't know what the threshold is that requires street lighting. Um, we It's not in our code, so we've never looked at it. Um, I just know that most of the major subdivisions here have them. Um, it's an amenity. Mm -hmm. it is a, it's a good thing to have. It's an amenity, mm -hmm. street lights. But it's also an expense. So if the, there's a homeowners association, if someone's got to pay the power bill, um so then you know how is that money spread out if it's something we require then we're going to be requiring that for the future someone's got to pay that bill that's where i think michael pointed out mm -hmm. it was a very different question requiring it to exist very different question than any but if it's going in sure i i definitely agree that if they're going to do it, it needs to be done right it needs to be done in a way that's going to be a, a benefit and not not detract from the we ask the question differently is it's a decision to recommend be required or not at a certain level is that something the town board should be considering at all is, is this the right subject time to consider Re sorry requiring what what clear description is to have street light you can give me an example so there happens that go to the village if you go in there at night, and I've been there and done that, had to turn the GPS on to find my way back out home. <laughs> but it, I, they don't have a street light. I think there's one now, but there was one time there was no street light. Well, one of these ordinances pulled out to add it to the new development. The new development is going to have to uh, require it. I believe I, Asheville does. I don't see Thing wrong with that. I think that would be a good idea. If the if the streets are maintained by the city, then the city of Asheville maintains the street lights. That's part of street maintenance. And yeah. we got into situations where there were street lights out there that the city was maintaining, but the road wasn't city maintained. But the, there was a it was established the city had been paying the power bill, therefore. Does that mean that the city now owns the street? And thankfully, I left before that got really heated. Well, um, the new development would have just fall over to the future HOA. No, my daughter. Made a lot and the street. They're going to sell the building. It's going to be even more. I like Alden Martin. And there's a homeowner association. I go on the street like and the city street. I'll give you a little different example of that one here. Another office. 
street like you see right now. That took a lot of hours for poor council to get that street light. <laughs> uh -huh. And because uh, we were paying for that, because we wanted that street light, we needed that street light. It was dangerous, and, and we were paying for it for a long time. Then it came to the point we poor council. Sure, that was many years ago, <laughs> and now we have a street light. Bill Grover pays for it, put up by Duke Anderson, <laughs> and it's the LED. That could be added to this, along with the rules about allowing that to perform. We could also add on the Bank of County Council a new requ a requirement for new developments going forward. Yeah, and I think that's the intent of this. Again, what I heard at the last meeting was mention of dark sky. So again, preserving the the rural character of the town by limiting light trespass and light pollution. So I think some of the largest things to focus on are fixture requirements. If the board wants to focus on lighting levels at different areas of the property, um, and then if you want to require new lighting, I, I think that's something up for discussion. But I, again, for me personally, I mean, does requiring more lighting go against dark sky? Uh, I don't know. I feel going to be some glare. Yes. Yeah. That I don't know. But they, yeah, but yeah, most most of the major subdivisions that have gone in, at least since I've been here, um, have street lights, and they are the decorative ones, but they're the newer ones where the LEDs built in, and I don't know if it's full cutoff, but it is cutoff where less than two and a half percent of the light is going up. Not last call. No, no. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think. I think for our first attempt at this, our, the first time we we discuss it, we we look at if you're going to put it in, here's how, this is it, and you then to include a site, to include a site, a lighting plan. It's very, it's not a very difficult thing. Um, most of the people I know that are site civil engineers provide that routinely. Places like Asheville, uh, other places, that's part of the package. Is the lighting plan so i think that it, it's not a big ask to make them make a major subdivision provide a lighting plan and i think if um, there's going to be outdoor area lighting provided by duke energy it should meet the the full cutoff i'm, I'm a fan of full cutoff in that if it's pedestrian level lighting it should it should meet you know it's a cutoff at the very minimum because it's a lower, lower height. And then I think for a residential home, um, I don't think we need to get into people lighting their homes just yet. I do like the part in here about lit signage because I've seen it in, in a few places where you're driving along at night, you think a car is about to hit you. And it turns out it's, lighting for a sign and it's right there in front of you so i would think that we would want ground flood. yeah the ground flood lights they should shine down and they not be shield. seen be shielded yes exactly because that's something that can impact the roadway the dot has standards and i think that we should um support those standards I understand no lighting plan is required for residential. What about commercial? Is that required right now for say a storage facility we're seeing that go up? No. They don't they don't provide it because we don't ask for it. But we're not asking for it in the ground plan. Correct. I Correct. think any commercial we get you quality back to residential, but I think when you hear this is everything. This is storage, this is maintenance of the road. Well, well and that that was the example that I actually responded to a complaint about was the new summit storage facility it's very high up elevation and there are some residences near it and they do have wall pack lighting now because they were doing a phase two 
and needed another zoning permit, I was able to just have a conversation with them and that they were amenable to installing shielding, which basically takes a normal wall pack light and directs it downward a little bit. Um, so that with some additional landscaping, you know, uh, the lights aren't going to go away, but it'll, it'll help address the issue with those neighbors. Aside from tree houses being a totally different animal, is there any other particular development that would be a tree development that would be covered in different ways? Conceptually, we talked about the pit. Conceptually, we talked about the improvement. Does it apply to grass seeds? Things might be the same as all the other. My, the way I see it, just based on reading through these, is that we would start focusing on non residential. So that means any non residential use, whether it be a gas station, car wash, shopping center, uh, storage facility, major subdivisions, again, primarily on roadway lighting. And that's about as far as I've gotten. I think I think the rest, you know, I, I would need further input from this board because again, getting into single family residential, you know, do you want to regulate someone's lights on their property? I think the only for a single family, I think the only regulation we should have is for Duke Energy installed um, neighborhood lighting. area lighting or neighborhood. Because I grew up with a, a Duke Energy light, Duke Power at the time, right outside the house, and it just lit up the world. And that was then. And, you know, that was installed because we had some stuff stolen. So, but. What was the fire level that the Jeffrey Development recently lighted? Sorry, did who? Jeffrey Development. The townhomes. I was just looking through some examples. I can look at that. While you guys continue discussing, right? It's non it's non residential or yeah. Townhomes, yeah. And would I'm sure they're gonna have lighting. They have to have certain safety lighting. Yeah, right? Oh, and I would think that they would use the proper lighting. I think we need to include some kind of basic requirements when we put agriculture on the greenhouse. I think a year or two ago, I saw some great bright lights up at Kay all the way over to the greenhouse over off the Lapid Road. Really bright. I read where you know they can have them in dark curtain curtains or uh, dark dark out blinds or something windows. And I did research that as well. And actually, dark the International Dark Sky Association their website has a whole section on greenhouses. Um, and I'm talking about you know um, institutions or developments that are ten times the size of, size of Lakeside. On Ladson Road, so mega greenhouses. Yeah, <clears throat> so mega greenhouses. Uh, they had an example of some in Europe where there's a city of like a hundred thousand, and then there's a greenhouse, and the greenhouse outshines the city. Um, now, I, again, I didn't call any of these other municipalities and and ask, you know, do you regulate agriculture with this? But traditionally, and I, I mentioned this in my staff report, traditionally. Uh, per state land use law, agriculture is usually only exempt in ETJs, which is extraterritorial jurisdiction, so outside of city limits, but where cities still have planning authority. <clears throat> and usually agriculture is subject to land use controls in city limits. Now, Mills River is unique because we have so much farmland and we're trying to preserve that. So again, in Mills River, we exempt all agriculture, but I heard that brought up last time. And so looking at the research, really the only control is shades, um, whether manually done or usually it's there for the bigger operations, it's automated where they cover the top at night. So there's less light going up into the sky. I know Ladson, I think, has at least the side shades installed because um, some of the neighboring... 
I think they did. So they, uh, they did. And they have very different light fixtures they too. Totally different. Yeah. Them. And they hang lower, I believe, as well. Mm-hmm. Lake size, what we all be talking about. Mm-hmm. I but, can see it becomes a big problem. We get more greenhouses, and we probably will. But, we have people taking tire lanes. Well, I the greenhouses are one one thing. I would not I, want to try to um, if there's a active. You got to make hay when the sun's shining. And it, sometimes when the sun isn't shining, you still got to make hay, right? You got to get out there and do agricultural work. And if if they have to set up some light plants or something to to do what they got to do or things like that, I I wouldn't want to be in. I wouldn't want to bother that because that's I don't know of a lot of things like that. But I that's why I hesitate trying to regulate agricultural. Greenhouses is a different animal, maybe. Yeah. Um, I think in the future, uh, we have multiple greenhouses like that below there. If we're going to change the landscape, there won't be much darkness. If not, we may get these type of blind and, uh, you know, yeah, mm-hmm. and they could still operate the same, just that they don't let the light out the roof. It is not. Well, I would be in favor of future greenhouses, maybe. Uh-huh. Requiring it, but as far as existing, you can't have a trigger in there. No, you can't even well, you can't have a trigger for, for you can't have any trigger ever. Uh-huh. No, not for it. Now, there, now, I'm talking about the the indoor lighting, the outdoor lighting still. still indoor lighting is different. Parking lot buildings, street side, whatever. Grandfather lean for his interior lighting will have to be. Even going forward, you're. But since we're, can see we're having more than one meeting, I would suggest. Have a conversation on those three. I say you move forward and talk about everything that's well, single family, mm-hmm. interior windows. Everything else is in the same bucket. Thank you. I have a question. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned Hendersonville early on and the pushback about requiring all existing lighting ordinances to be in place or it interferes with any pushback, so they didn't adopt that. So of the other municipalities that you looked at and the research that you've done, is it are there more that have, you know, a, a plan where everybody eventually has to adhere to it or more that do not? Most of them did not have that. I'll have to do a quick scan, but m- most of them did not have uh, an amortization clause that required all non-residential lighting to comply within a specific time frame. Do we have a sunset for any, anything else? Signs? You know, we have pretty strict rules for our signs now. People grandfathered in with a grandfathered in with a timeline. Yeah, we don't. As far as I'm aware, the town has no amortization to require compliance of anything existing. Again, the the only example I can think of is corridor overlay district and building additions. Um, But again, even with corridor overlay, a good example was the variance um, for the skyline plastics on Jeffress Road. They were building a building addition that I think was about the same as their existing building size. Um, but our ordinance requ- only required the new building to have those material, you know, acceptable materials, which it again would, size. which would make it look strange because then, and that was their case, you'd have a half a metal building and half a brick building. Um, but as far as I'm aware, we we don't require anything that's legally non conforming or grandfathered in. To have to comply. Changing the subject a little bit, I think that 
laser lights need to be in this? I need a definition of that. Okay. I'm a pilot. Oh, you're of that. <laughs> and one of the things now, one of the things that can really laser energy is much more powerful and it can cause temporary blindness, et cetera. Even a laser pointer. And um, all these airplanes flying overhead, going into Asheville Airport, et cetera. Um, a laser light show is the kind of thing that's generally put in uh, the notice to air operations so that you're aware. Uh, if you look at the chart for Clemson, which I don't recommend after last night, at least for a little while, if you look at the air, the chart, it says caution laser light activity because they have sometimes they have laser shows. So, well, there was tons of words of laser. There are, yeah, so, there are, yes. Yeah, I'm a pilot too, but uh, yes. Well, let's go fly. <laughs> but um, I think that you know, laser is one of those things that needs to have attention brought to it. That you know, you can really do some damage. Uh, I mean, I'm not talking. The, the kids and the cat and the laser like that. But, you know, if you go outside and just some people want to do it to draw attention, you know, like the old searchlights and, and searchlights are in some of these ordinances that you don't set those up for advertising. I remember seeing them. Somebody, I think, at Hendersonville 30 years ago had one set up. You could see the Jackson building in Asheville used to have a searchlight on top. You could see for 100 miles. And yeah. And so, you know, those types of things. If it's permitted, that means that they've gone through procedures. They know how to reg They know how to do this. That's a different thing. But I, I like seeing those things included in here. And bunk Bunkum and Asheville's ordinances have both of those prohibitions: searchlights and laser displays lights. Another thing to mention and. You know, just good to include, and I think we have this with our sign ordinances. You know, nothing that could cause confusion or is similar to a traffic control device, mm -hmm. as well. And there are there are state laws against displaying traffic control devices. Um, people like to go to flea markets and buy an old traffic signal and set them up in their yard. If you can see it from the road, that's a a bad thing. Same thing with road signs, stop signs, etc. You shouldn't be able to see it. From the roadway now, if the states, you know, they they don't go out looking for things like that. But I have been involved in some letters sent to property owners saying, you know, what you have is in violation of state statute, and you know, leave it at that. So just a few other points I wanted to get through and get some feedback on. Um, so most of the ordinances we've been through, again, are about lighting plans, lighting fixtures, and prohibitions, you know, shining lights directly in the sky or into neighboring properties. Um, one I included that was the bulk of the last section of the attachments was the Dark Sky Association's model lighting ordinance. Um, and I just wanted to bring this up because it is a unique approach. So um, both Black Mountains, while I do like the definition and the the images, they regulate light by zoning district. Similarly, Dark Sky Association's model ordinance, which was developed with the assistance of the Illuminating Engineering Society, uses zoning overlay districts. Uh, to control lighting where you would have different lighting standards by district. Again, just presenting it to see if that's an approach this board considers, or is Mills River small enough and rural enough that we should just do a blanket, a blanket requirement? Do you want to maintain that? For those that do, those were the two options, correct? Okay. Yeah, targeting by zoning that I included. Um, again, I, I'm not saying it's it's the correct fit, but I just wanted to present the board with different 
techniques. Sure, and I think that's great. I think we are rural enough, and I think if um, a use comes in, a commercial use, a way for them to show that they are going to be good neighbors, especially in a, a rezoning or at some point maybe a conditional zoning situation, is to have a good lighting plan that will not affect the neighbors. I think that's that's important. And so all of our zoning came in place where they You might be neighborhood commercial, but I'd have to check. Well, and that's the point, though. You don't even look that up. That's a, <laughs> the point there is we're, we're all residential, commercial, retail, agriculture. It's, it's um, yeah. how could you possibly do anything other than what you're doing? Because you're not current use. That was M MR30, sorry. Maybe we could start out with something basic. Can, can it be amended later? I think if we needed it Besides more. Have a, a basic uh, lighting ordinance. I'll have to. Yeah. So well, everything can always be amended. <laughs> yeah. It's the process. But so maybe we shouldn't think too deep into it. Start out with the basic things that are a problem right now. That my thought was moving forward is that based on some of the feedback we have tonight, we would begin drafting text, you know, not not a complete ordinance, but taking some of the things we've seen and liked from the different ordinances and putting it into a draft version for your review. And then we could continue the discussion about what you like and don't like in that. And then again, can continue looking at these examples um, about what we would want what we would want to incorporate. Um, moving forward. I think the only other thing I still need or would like clarification on is the foot candle measurement. You know, do we want to just focus on focus on full cutoff, you know, dark sky friendly fixtures for new developments, or do we want um, actual light measurements at property lines and a limit set to that? Now that I understand the cutoff, that's, that's definitely a priority. Mm -hmm. I think we could we could set a standard for foot candles at a property line, which then could be concern driven. I don't like to use the word complaint because that puts it in a negative. But if if there's a, uh, a facility or something built next to you and lights coming onto your property then it's a way to go out there and have a quantitative measurement to say, yes, there's more than one, one foot candle per foot here, and you can measure that with a light meter. And then that's a way to then um, make sure that people comply. So it's a way to, to measure that. So okay. I like the idea of having something like that in place. That doesn't mean that we should have to go out to every single new installation and go measure it. But if there's an issue, then then we've got something in or print. Mm -hmm. so and the, the site, the plan submitted, you can't reach you. You're not going to get a permit issue. That's correct. So again, you, using correct. using Summit as an example, if they had, if we had required a light plan and they had submitted with something like this adopted, and again, if they I'll have to put up an example of an isolux drawing. If they show how far the light is going to be downcast from their fixtures, and if it is above the requirements, they need a different fixture, or they need height, proximity, mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> enforcement again is another way to bring um, lighting nuisances, I guess, in compliance. So, uh, you know, amortization is a way where the town or municipality says you must change these to something compliant in 10 years, 15 years. But let's say I live next to, I don't know, a warehouse building with wall pack lights, and we do pass this with a one foot candle standard at the property line. If someone would like that were to complain, and if we were to go out and it was above the standard, 
we would have a conversation with that commercial property owner and maybe they just put, I mean, $5 metal shields on the lights on that side of the building only. So again, it's a, I'm t yeah, if, if we go with foot candle at property line standards, I'm just saying it's a different way to bring nuisance lights into compliance without requiring someone to replace all lighting on their property in 10 years. That light, one route was 50% or more replacement per day. That was one. That had to be, and then this would be proportionate to the other. Now, again, I, we, we do have limited staff, so I mean, it, it would be on a- Well, I hesitate to like set this staff. up so that we then have to go to existing uses. Um, I think if, if it's there, if it's grandfathered in, then it is what it is to go and, and pass an ordinance then that we start looking for uh, people who are not conforming and then try to make them conform, I think. Um, I, I would suggest that if we do have a foot candle standard, it's for new in a lighting plan and a lighting not plan. not me without with a photo meter at someone's property line not not unless well i mean at some point we may want to have that because mm -hmm. um the plan can say what the plan says mm -hmm. and then what goes in you're not saying that anyone would do that in mills river or any commercial entity or whatever but you know sometimes there is a mistake and the, the wrong fixture gets put up there mm -hmm. because whatever's on the shelf may be what gets put up. And then the light, suddenly, if there's an issue, we, I think we need to have a way to so quantify that. Sure. If the light plan would, absolutely. Well, if if then a light plan is but there may be a use that doesn't require a light plan but it's well, i would say would all commercial uses then require a lighting plan i would at least need fixture details mm -hmm. wouldn't, wouldn't we want to upset all non-residential areas and and major all non major stuff and then set a trigger for tri flight such as individual structure and a major or more than five, whatever we want to set that. The non-residential, I think you're only less or less on residential. I think we all agree non-residential. And then a way to make sure that they meet it is to have a way to measure the light at the property line. So even though if it's not used for, for enforcement. Um, verification. Well, verification or at some point, you know, at some point, at some point, maybe not now, but have yeah, everything new. So, date, everything new. Everything new. And we're never grandfathered in for even the So then, having a way to quantify it, because just to say it's too bright is just like to say it's too loud, because someone's definition of music that's too loud may be different to mine and it depends on the music. You know, my wife's waiting for this. If it's Pat Boone singing Crazy Train, it's hard to get that too loud. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, she's watching, I think. So I, I would say, though, that if there's no appetite, it sounds like, obviously, for amortizing over any time pre existing businesses that are grandfathered in and that sort of thing. So I would. I would just counter a little bit what you said. I would be more comprehensive or be as comprehensive as possible because if, if we're not, then you have you know folks who come in, we realize it's a problem, then we have to correct it, and more and more come. So I try to be as comprehensive as possible now. It, I know it's a little more work, but I, I think you want to do that because if you know somebody comes in, we haven't quite thought about that, um, they're grandfathered in then at that point, right? And so while we're talking about it, whether it takes one meeting, two meetings, or whatever, we want to try to be as comprehensive as possible um, so we don't miss anything. With still the ability to update it at a later right, date if necessary. So, yeah, I think that's a good compliment. Isn't it true 
would you distinguish the amortization point from um, what you said about the new Hendersonville um, ordinance, which is different? It's not amortization. <laughs> Hard it's a hard word to say tonight, um, but it says that it requires if you need to replace fifty percent or more, then you need to come into compliance. I mean that makes a lot of sense. Right, because that's there's the a cost thing. there. Right, there's a cost right. there, and so we're not requiring a new cost. They're choosing to do that, and then that makes sense. To I agree with that. that point, yeah. It, so it's it's not like within a timeline that you have to do it, but at the time of replacement. Right, we're not adding that. That was actually going to be my next question for clarification. So there's there's consensus to in, include something like a provision like that, that if you're replacing half the lighting, or I think it also says doubling the size of your site, which means 50% more lighting, everything would have to be brought into compliance. I would think something along those lines, because the old lights leak, right? So um, if they're replacing lights, we would want someone to bring that into compliance. I would think if that's the overall objective of the lighting or dark side proposal on that. So that's a good point. We'd have or to define it. You'd have to define it. Yeah, you'd have to define it. Whatever you define it. Yeah. What you said, if I understood you correctly, was if they increase the, the space by more than 50%, then all of it needs to be done. What if they add the 40%? Because that 40% new needs to be fixed. We didn't trigger the whole thing to be dry under code, but what about new parts? You're, you're right, the 40% that's new. So again, let's use Skyline Plastics as an example on Jeffress Road. <clears throat> they had an, ex an existing building, let's just say 10,000 square feet. They built an addition of 10,000 square feet. <clears throat> so well, actually that's a bad example. They built an addition of 8,000 square feet. So if we had this adopted, all the lighting on the side of that building on the addition would have to be compliant. But if they did, 10,000 square feet or 11,000 square feet, the whole site would have to be compliant. Okay. So if if they increase the parking lot by 20 spaces and add a light, the new light, all the parking lot would have to be compliant. Correct. So I like that. And the, and the same with like doubling a parking lot size. Is it, Sorry. Mr. Foster has a point. What about a replacement light? I think we can put it in the ordinance, um, but I don't think that's something. I mean, we're not out checking fixtures, I guess is the good answer. <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean we can't include it. Well, I, know, I know we're not out taking a picture, as you said, but we can let them know that we would like to, if you're going to replace it, bring it up to standard. If you're going to add some, bring it up to standard. It would be more than just the light. It could be the, I think the word now, cutoff. Mm -hmm. Right? That could be a standard that if you're late, that that needs to go to mm -hmm. that off or cut off. Full cut off. Yes, sir. But yeah, well, I thought you just put all that out there and put, you know, a proposal or a draft or whatever and something you can do on. Good from that. All right. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> yeah. I think we'd give them <laughs> and and everyone's okay, I assume, with the standard exemptions of flagpoles, seasonal events, all that stuff. All right. Christmas lights. Yeah. Which means I will have to take my Christmas lights down after Christmas. Oh, that's true. <laughs> so now if I can get my bride to not notice. Good point. I'll plug it. So Jeff did the point of clarification. I, I do want to talk about building my site as well, like this. I agree. Bigger project than the back. I think I think that's I and we should really, if there if there were a way to have some people who have greenhouses or are familiar with the business to come talk to us, and this is where, um, you know, now if if there's anyone in the public. Who wants to come share their opinion because this is going to affect you hopefully it'll be a very positive effect um come tell us what you think what is important to the citizens we'd love to hear that input we meet the first tuesday of each month that's right so love to we'll have a search light out the next meeting <laughs> there you go. Get their and laser light show 
tell all the pilots going over to keep one eye closed. So, uh, okay. All right. Next, we have new business. We're showing none. And additional items, board comments. Yes, thank you for all the work you do. Oh. Yes, I am I would like to say how proud I am of town staff and sure. what you all do for us. Um, we're very blessed. Thank you. And I'd like to, I'm very blessed to have board members sitting here with me. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be the, the weakest member of a very strong team. Well, it's hard to look right past you. Your, your distinguished look there is very hard for me. Uh, although I'm not sure about the Panthers. <laughs> look at the monitor. <laughs> um, Sorry. I'm looking at yours because I've already I've already put my agenda. Staff yeah. update. Yes. Staff update. Staff update. Those a couple brief things. So uh, conditional zoning will be going back before council on September 14th. That includes uh, including the two acre minimum acreage size provision that this board adopted last time. Uh, the rezoning for 1936 Butler Bridge Road was approved by council on August 10th. So that's been completed. That is now zoned to neighborhood commercial. And uh, just wanted to make you aware, staff's been working on, I've been calling it administrative corrections to the zoning code, just working on some of these tweaks and fixes, you know, issues we've identified over time. And I'm hoping to present the first one to you at your next meeting, which would be updates to our special use permit procedures. Uh, the most urgent need for that is currently we require all special use permit mailings to be sent by registered mail, which is about $15 a letter. Um, so it's very costly. I don't think it's the only type of public notice mailing that requires that. So um, other changes will be in the text amendment, but we're looking at changing that to first class mail, just like we do for everything else. Save some taxpayer money. That's all I got. Okay. Would there happen to be a um, motion? motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you all. So, Pat Boone did go through a state.